they talked about psychology without using the word. They talked about the problems of, of the mind. So in that sense, uh, my view of psychology is a very ancient view. However, um, it, it has as uh, a lot of bearing on, on the development of modern day psychology, although there's been many changes. So this is my private image. And what I want to do is to say a few um, things about thoughts and feelings based primarily on ancient views. Um, so I do apologize to psychologists if uh, it's not completely in view with you, but in completely in uh, uh, matching your views of uh, these things. And then I'm going to work my way forward to some issues to do with security, where um, how we think and feel and our behavior can have uh, an effect on how we use technology. So the first thing I want to talk about is these two terms, what cyber means and what psychology means. Psychology, um, it comes up in several ways, uh, the psyche comes up in several ways. Um, it was a goddess um, and it was, it was also a concept um, in ancient Greek uh, writings and, and debate. It means breath of life. It means um, something, a spirit. It is often translated as the soul or spirit. Uh, if you know anything about the story between Psyche and Cupid, then you'll know that it's related to the four, the, the problems, the troubles uh, of the human soul, which involves, and in Greek times, the soul and the mind sometimes were interchangeable in debate. Um, so this is my roots into psychology, is through this ancient philosophy. Of course, and I do again apologize to psychologists. I was only told at the last minute by Ryan that there's going to be various psychologists in the room. But the one definition of, uh, of psychology in the modern sense is a, a science and study of the mind, uh, looking at the mental characteristics or attitudes of us as we think, uh, our co cognitive functions, etc., etc. So that's the psychology bit. The cyber bit is quite interesting. What does cyber mean? Um, and we have endless debates on what that means. And I have my own personal definitions. My own personal definition comes from this statement here from Plato, and it says, steering a ship and governing a state nation, state or nation. Um, this is the ancient definition of what cyber means. It means to govern, to manage, to navigate, to steer. So this quote from uh, Plato uh, has the word cyber in it. See the second word along in Greek. Um, so it, this is the origin of this word. We don't quite use it this way today, uh, but this is the origin. And one of the greatest um, cyber psychological warfare, warfare, warfare incidents happened uh, in the Greek time, uh, and it was the Battle of Salamis. And I'm not going to go through the details of this, but it was a war between the, um, the Athenian fleet and the Persians under the uh, King Xerxes. And the Greeks won this. Uh, through uh, some tactical moves. They were good on sea, the Persians were good on land, and they, through good management of ships and strategic positioning and psychology, playing on the minds of the Persians, they won this decisive battle. Before that, the Persians had taken over Athens, and then the, the Athenians had to escape to the shore the court of Athens called Piraeus. So this was a strategic battle. 
And um, this is a quote from one of the history books at the time. But if you look at this history book, cyber comes up time and time again because it relates to the the management, governance, direction of things. So cyber naught means to to uh, pilot a ship or to steer a ship. Nought means as in the word nautilus. Okay, so what is cyber psychology? Okay, I've given you one definition here. Cyber psychology is related to managing and governing the effect of cyberspace on the psychology of the individual. How we think and behave in cyberspace in relation to the communications we make, our interactions um, with technologies that we use in cyberspace can have a direct, direct influence on whether we uh, are at risk. And so the in, uh, any risk we take, there is likely to be some form of impact. It might not be great or it might be catastrophic. So I've been looking at this problem of cyber psychology for about 10 years now, and I work with uh, two universities in England uh, and uh, a university in Austria, uh, looking at some of the challenging problems um, from a psychological point of view of handling technology uh, that we use to communicate, do our buying and shopping, financial transactions, etc. Whatever we do. So, just a bit of theory. Uh, this is me, and I interact with the world. I'm called the rest of the world, the others, or others. Um, and I think, perceive, I feel things, uh, and I can have emotions. Um, the ancient. Uh, Philosophy, there are only four basic categories of emotions, and those were fears, uh, anxieties, desires, and pleasures. But they had various subcategories, so you can find grief and joy, uh, or always amongst those things. And that relates to my, who I am, my personality, my ego, my disposition, my hexis, which is my habits. But of course, I am, I am influenced by others. What others say to me, they might persuade me, uh, influence me to do things. That also has uh, quite an impact. And so, um, after a, a well-known psychologist, uh, Aaron Beck, he, he developed this thing called cognitive behavioral therapy, where he had this cognitive model of thoughts uh, relating to feelings, relating to behaviour. So our thoughts can um, influence our feelings, <laughs> our feelings can influence our behaviour and other ways around. And of course, one of the things that can influence our thoughts is our language. So what we say to ourselves can influence our thoughts, and our thoughts can also influence what we say to ourselves and to others. So we have these, this this cycle uh, now this model he particularly used Aaron Beck to look at depression uh, negative thoughts such nothing good ever happens to me uh, the future looks bleak I'm worthless, it's my fault all these things that are commonly related to depression of course these have an impact on uh, our feelings uh, we have low self-esteem, we are pessimistic maybe, we're feeling helpless, and of course that relates to our behaviour uh, in the sense of I, I don't want to get things done, I can't concentrate, I withdraw from what I'm doing, I have no interest in things. And so this is a model which relates to negative views of myself, of others and the world around me. And so these models uh, just give you a sense of how our, our 
eternal mind works, our mind works, and we'll see a bit later that this has an effect on the decisions we make uh, with regard to risk. Um, another relatively modern uh, <coughs> therapist or psychologist, um, Ellis, looked at uh, what he calls an ABC model. Events, situations, incidents happen. Sorry, the, the contrast is not very good here. So the top one is A, that the events, situations, incidents happen. They uh, can influence our beliefs. And though that in itself has consequences. So a negative event may happen. I might take a rational view of this and my feelings and emotions uh, hopefully will be healthy. Same negative uh, event might happen. I might take an irrational, I might have irrational thoughts and beliefs and I might be in an unhealthy state. So these are the types of things that help us <coughs> work out whether our decisions uh, are going to be good or bad. Another aspect is our perception of the world and uh, whether our perception matches reality uh, or not. Um, what we think and believe, how we perceive things, um, our impressions through experience, through learning, through memories, etc. There's a famous stoic piece of sex psychology that says something is, how do we perceive that? But either we can agree with it or we don't agree with it. Or something is not, and we can either agree or not agree with it. So something is, and it appears to be so, or it does not appear to be so. So these four combinations make up in ancient views of how the mind works is how we perceive the world. And so you can see from this, we can have true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives. And so how do we view ourselves in relationship to the world? Um, we often have different views. 82% of executives in a company might think that they, they have a healthy work environment. <coughs> but only 32% of the actual employees uh, concur with that position. We may have a certain percentage of individuals <coughs> perceive that uh, engaging in a particular activity uh, presents a risk, uh, and others may perceive something totally different. So we're all very unique in what we think, how we feel, etc., etc. So... You know, I might form an impression uh, maybe someone that I'm dealing with is harmless or they may be threatening. I might trust them or distrust them. Uh, and that's just my perception based on my beliefs, my understanding, my previous experience with them. So how often do I trust people online? How often do I get lured into a situation online because of my perceived trust my understanding, my feelings, my thoughts about those people, what those people have said to me, how I process that information. So what I see, what I do, what I say, what I think, all the senses that I have, all that provides me information uh, as to how I'm going to react and behave. Now, um, there are different twists to all this. Um, cognitive ease, which is a term that's quite common these days, um, actually didn't originate 40 years ago, it originated two and a half thousand years ago. Um, I feel certain about something and I think I'm right in my feelings, my understanding of something and the world around me makes sense. 
and this place has been a good frame of mind. So I have this inbuilt feeling, good feeling, but this can give me a false sense of security. We often see this uh, with young people, teenagers online. Um, studies online, uh, studies of teenagers using social networking, cognitive ease is a problem. Um, they think that they're, what they're doing is making them feel happy, or, and they feel uh, safe, but in fact they're getting a false sense of security. So, uh, there are two quite interesting uh, mathematical psychologists. One is Kahneman, the other one is Tversky. Um, Tversky is not with us anymore, but Kahneman still writes. In his latest book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, I've, made it, I've brought out a quote here from it. Um, we feel comfort um, with our conviction of the world when it makes sense to us. It gives us some security. Um, and we have this enormous ability, endless ability, to ignore the obvious or to ignore our own ignorance. And one of the major problems of us um, is our ignorance in things. And so we have this inbuilt feeling uh, that everything is good. So we bring in information to us, uh, as to, and that generates within us what to believe, what not to believe. And we get from that a good feeling, cognitive ease, or we get a bad feeling, cognitive disease, or we feel indifferent. And through our experience, past perceptions, our beliefs, etc., we rely on what is familiar, what is easy, what validates our pre-existing beliefs, or what you see is all there is. So we have this narrow view of the world. Um, and so this is a, we're sort of biased in a way in our thinking. <coughs> and so we like to feel secure, we like to think that nothing's wrong, so we are biased in the way we handle things, how we make decisions. Another thing that creeps in, and this is a very serious issue, especially when we're making risk, uh, decisions about risk, is our distorted view of the world. Sometimes we rely just on we overgeneralize the situation. Not looking at the important details, we just overgeneralize it. <coughs> Sometimes we're just running on automatic thoughts. We build up habits and we just rely on those habits. Sometimes we have very black and white thinking. These can all distort our, <coughs> our thinking, the way we don't necessarily think in a rational way or we don't think in a way where there is good reasoning. So our judgments, our um, applications of our impressions of the world can often be distorted. And like the, <coughs> the problem with impressions, the example I gave, if we have a negative view of ourselves the world and the future, then it's possibly because there are errors in our thinking, and those errors are caused by some form of distortion. And then there's something called cognitive dissonance. You might be a smoker, and at the same time you realize that smoking causes cancer. Well, you know, someone's stating the obvious to you, and you don't take any heed of it, you do the opposite. That's, that's dissonance. Um, Aesop's famous story, The Fox and the Grapes, uh, is a subversion of our rationality. Sometimes it's called sour grapes, to use phrase. Um, so someone desires something that's unattainable. <coughs> 
and even if there is a dissonance, they tend to diminish it, reduce it, because it's not to their liking. It doesn't. It's not what they really want. Um, and so it causes them to do something that's not realistic or proper or rational. So these are some of the, the drivers that have been used by the research that I've done and many others to look at some uh, quite serious um, problems with, with using technology in cyberspace. A familiar phrase that's come up over time is hacking into the mind. We're not talking about mind reading now, otherwise it might be making lots of money. Um, we're talking about just ordinary persuading, influencing, manipulating, directing people's thoughts. Messing with your thoughts, if you like. Or implanting thoughts in people's minds. And so, getting into someone's thoughts, suggesting things to people, uh, asking them to do things in a, sometimes a very subtle way. Of course, this is one of the basic techniques of social engineering getting people to do things which result in scams result in unauthorised access into systems because you've asked people to do things in the right way using the right techniques the right language, the right words etc. And it also is one of the problems of uh, social networking and in particular in two very important age groups one is uh, in the teenagers and the low teenage years and also in the uh, the upper age group I'm not going to say when that starts but So those two groups are very vulnerable to suggested um, words. So getting into someone's head, so you can influence their feelings, and you can actually influence their emotions, and you, by that means, you could ask, get them to do things. Um, <coughs> so this power of persuasion, the art of persuasion, um, you're trying to change someone's beliefs, maybe their attitudes to behaviour, or what they, how they act, what how they do things. Um, you might influence uh, their making a decision. Aristotle wrote a book called The Art of Rhetoric, and it relies on. The good speaker um, can influence his audience by relying on two things, ethics, logic, and emotion. So if you give a speech in a court, and this was used in court cases in, in courtrooms in ancient, ancient Athens, the good, in, the, in those days it wasn't lawyers, but um, the good speaker could influence his audience by presenting evidence which has a bit of each of those. You say what is right and wrong, you give a log logical argument for that, but also you add a bit of emotion in it so you draw people in. And then by that means you've probably captured a good percentage of the audience. So we know this happens. Politicians, good politicians, can do it. Sales and marketing, any advocacy. Um, children do it to their parents. Uh, they don't use logic or <laughs> ethics. They just go straight to the emotions. <coughs> um, teenagers do it quite well. Um, having three sons. 
now I have now got five granddaughters. I've had lots of they've, they've they've practiced on me quite a lot. So teenagers do it. But we also do it, adults do it. Parties presenting and defending claims in court do it. They present arguments to try to influence other people to say whether someone's guilty or not guilty. Propaganda. But on, online, we see in social engineering uh, a lot of online scams. Um, social networks, all the social media, you'll find this uh, and you've probably experienced it in one way or another. Uh, so hacking into the mind is one of the uh, entry points into some of the security problems we have. The techniques for <coughs> implementing thoughts, reverse psychology, which uh, is often banded about as a, a technique. Um, but there's also less direct techniques uh, than just saying outright, walking around the subject, gradually implanting ideas over a, a period of time, slowly but surely introducing thoughts, seeds into he people's heads to uh, get the right effect. Uh, putting doubts into people's heads is also another effect, putting fear and uncertainty into people's minds. <laughs> so these are some of the things, and um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, figures of authority. The often quoted case of someone phoning up a company and talking to the CEO's secretary. I hope there's no CEO's secretary here. Um, <laughs> or any CEOs. Um, and you report to be someone in authority that knows your boss and to through various means, you can work your way into their minds and they form a trust relationship with you and before they know it, they're offering you information which they shouldn't be offering you. Uh, of course, another issue of scarcity. Uh, online, you may have um, receive emails talking about the scarcity of something so it's drawing you in you think oh this thing's scarce I must be a part of that or have some of what is being offered as being scarce so again it's, it's, it's working on your mind to draw you in <coughs> uh, people, like the, the penultimate one there the power of someone's charm. Some of them might be charming, can often draw, draw, draw you in. And so it's a matter, some of it's just pure trustworthiness, some of it's charm, some of it's using the power of authority. Um, to influence you. And all this hacking into the mind, uh, we've looked at all these different uh, aspects, the cognitive ease, bias, distortion, and dissonance, and they all play uh, different parts, but very significant parts in some of the problems that different countries are having around the world with teenagers uh, using social networks, Facebook, Twitter, etc. And we've done studies, we've got evidence to show, and, and tests to show that this is the case. So, social engineering, um, <clears throat> again, you're trying to get into someone's thoughts, <clears throat> you're trying to get them to perform actions, give information, and you um, implant a thought, uh, an opinion of you, hopefully that will influence their feelings. Uh, and influence their behaviour. And as we know, 
Um, social engineering has been used to divulge information, uh, to commit fraud, and various other, and, and to gain access into people's systems. Um, we've all either experienced or we know others have experienced the use of emails and people whether or not they know it may see a need or have a they're greedy and someone offers them something to share uh, such as uh, a winnings a lottery winnings or inheritance and that that golden apple that you uh, you seek is being offered to you so you go for it you could also be distracted uh, in doing uh, uh, in the emails that you might receive you might be deceived in some way uh, all these various aspects can to you being uh, scammed in some way. But they all rely on playing on your uh, on your mind. But it isn't just the individual. Here are two examples of banks that have been uh, attacked very successfully over the last few years. And it's because of the employees um, were subject to social engineering tax. Social networking and social sites, um, this doesn't just appear as a problem to teenagers and the, and the senior citizens, I should say, um, but it could affect anybody. So we might see this as an extension of our real world where we can communicate our thoughts, feelings, likes, dislikes, behaviours, locations, what we're eating at any particular time in the day, uh, what we've just bought. Um, so it's a form of emotional expression online. It gives us a certain freedom and liberty. We can share with many others what we're doing in life. And of course, social engineers that are manipulating uh, social networks start to produce messages that sound very believable and very persuasive. And it's not just the individual that's using these sites, of course. Political parties are using these, companies are now using them. Um, advertise, but also to promote news or promote propaganda. Now, some of the things that have been a problem over the, um, at least the last 10 years is people suffering from depression, low self-esteem, isolation, obsessive and addictive behaviour, anxiety disorders, through social networking. These are all the way we think, influencing the way we feel. And so it's not um, a simple problem. It's not a, an, in, an easy problem to solve. Of course, we also see online predators, online bullying, various forms of abuse online using social networks. So that's just a few of the problems. I'm going to indicate a few more of the problems uh, in a minute. But I just want to take a brief moment to talk about risk. Risk um, is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. That's pretty abstract. Um, you know, all of our lives involve some form of risks day in, day out. How we deal with those can make a big influence, big impact on our lives. I'll change that definition to it's a combination of an 
an event, the consequences of an event, and the likelihood of that, likelihood of that event happening. So, <coughs> the question is, does taking a risk make you anxious, fearful, panic? You know you've got to do something, you know it's risky, are you anxious about doing that thing? Or do you get a thrill? Are you happy for taking the risk? So those two aspects, one is risk averse, and when you're anxious, you are risk averse. You don't really want to take the risk. When you get a thrill or a kick out of taking the risk, then you don't mind seeking that risk. <coughs> And each of us have different comfort levels. We're, none of us are the same when it comes to risk. We react in different ways depending on how we see the world, our perception, how we think about the world. That has a direct relationship to the decisions we make about risk. And these two mathematical psychologists, Tversky and Tyneman, Tyneman uh, spent a lot of time researching this in all different situations. Now, when two people are confronted with the same external conditions uh, and they have to make a decision about risk, they may make a different decision. If it was, say, a negative event, like I illustrated before, one may see no problem in this and feel happy with making, taking the risk. Another one made me feel anxious and not want to take the risk. So, on the one side, there's a risk-related situation. <coughs> you may feel unconcerned, indifferent, doesn't really worry you. You're very calm about this. Another person, same situation, may have thoughts of danger and harm, may have unpleasant and troubled thoughts, may uh, experience fears and anxiety. So this is the problem of risk. It's not just a simple calculation, it involves some psychology. So. What is security? <coughs> any any definitions? Anyone has it to guess? <coughs> okay. okay. I'll uh, give you one definition. This definition was produced in 1601. It's in the first English dictionary. Security is the fear of nothing. Today you look at an international standard and it says security is the preservation of information against, uh, sorry, it's the protection of information to preserve its integrity and confidentiality. So here is 1601, the first English definition. Security is the fear of nothing. It's something related to our feelings and thoughts and all this. So, this previous example, you can see the person on the left feels pretty secure about life. You don't worry about this negative incident that's happened. Whereas the person, sorry, the person on the left, and the person on the right feels a bit insecure. So, so risk psychology has, is about how we perceive things. It's about uh, our attitude towards uh, risks, the judgment we make on risks, about risks. Um, and all that then, all those things are related to if we are uncomfortable with a particular thought that influence our feelings, you may, the, may make the wrong decision. 
So, risk um, assessments, risk uh, calculations, decisions, it's very subjective. It can, what can influence it is our fears and worries about things, uh, concerns about health, safety, finance, life and death. whether we uh, are able to tap into that unique resource that every human being has, and that's our reasoning faculty, where we, unlike animals, uh, we have this faculty that we can <coughs> think, argue, and debate rationally. But if we throw all that away, uh, we can make the wrong decisions. And this is why <coughs> nonsense sells. You can sell all sorts of nonsense for people. This is why a lot of sales uh, and marketing is effective. Because it's, if it's nonsense, it sells. Well, we believe it. So, uh, what is our attitude to risk? Are we risk averse or are we risk seeking? Risk averse tendency gives losses more weight than gains. <coughs> we rather make a sure gain than a, a significant loss. And risk seeking is the other way. So we can do, we can be we can be risk averse in our life, making sure we don't make any risky decisions, make, don't, don't take any gambles. Um, and so we're very rigid in life. Um, but that means we might miss opportunities. Whereas if we are risk seeking, we take, we take high risks because we see opportunities. However, they may render significant impacts and consequences. So here's an example. Imagine you need New Zealand, and this is going to happen, I think, next week, uh, by the way, uh, an outbreak of an uncommon, uh, I should say, UK disease. Um, Asian disease is going to hit and kill 600 people. You've got two options. You've got to make a decision. Do you go for option A or option B? Option A is if two, uh, if it's adopted, 200 people will be saved. Option B uh, is that <laughs> uh, one third uh, that 600 people will be saved, and two thirds no one will be saved. So how many people would go for A? Put up your hands. Not many. You have to choose one. So the rest of you are going to choose B. So the majority of people would choose B. You're willing to take the gamble uh, of just one third that 600 people will be saved. Of course, and a higher probability that no one will be saved. Okay, so most people go for B. <laughs> okay, same problem. C. If C is adopted, 400 people would die. D. If adopted, one third probability that no one would die, and two thirds people. That's it. No one would die. Two thirds probability to six hundred of them. Right, who's going to go for C? One. <laughs> Two. <laughs> You're not a very good audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did anybody notice anything about A, B, C, and D? Yeah. The same so, options. What's the same? A and C are the same, and B and D are the same. Okay. 
Um, it was difficult to do it in this room, but when I've done this in the past with sort of like secret ballots, then we get interesting results. People switch. So you, you observe the white thing, A is the same as C, and B is the same as D. All we've done is change the emphasis. So in A, we've changed the emphasis from people being saved to people dying. And that switch that could trigger emotions off. Now, in, in larger experiments with more complicated scenarios, uh, you can see that people do switch. So they select A in one scenario and D in another scenario. They shouldn't have done that. So, uh, losses cause greater emotional impact on individuals. Um, and this is a problem. If we are influenced uh, by situations, um, we could veer off to being risk averse or veer off to being risk seeking. So, this is some other examples. And as you can say, in all of them, you know, the first one is, you know, which would you prefer? Gaining 100,000 New Zealand dollars? It's a sure gain. Or taking a gamble? 50-50 possibility of gaining 200,000, even more, or gaining nothing. What is your... How are we going to deal with this? We, this is all theoretical at the moment, but think of yourself having to make these decisions not with money but say with your health or whether you are in charge of saving someone uh, by say a medical treatment you're giving them so all, the sa all these are the same it's all based on whether you're going to gain something or lose something and whether that triggers off any emotions so this simple table Significant gains, significant losses, high probability, low probability. So the risk averse will go for high probabilities with significant gains or low probabilities where there's significant losses. And risk seeking will go the other way around. So this is a framing effect, which is quite common in, oh, quite common in, in psychological um, uh, disciplines. Um, but it, in particular in uh, risk decision making uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful tool for modelling how we or how we should go when we look at the what's commonly called the asymmetry of human choice so um, then I, I'll quote again these two I find called psychologists, they wrote something called prospect theory, uh, analysis of decision under risk, which goes into the theory of all this in, a, in much, much greater detail. And again, just populating this table a bit more, gains and losses, high probability, low probability. So the high probability is getting more towards the high end of the scale, where things are getting more certain low probability is getting at the lower end of the scale where things are getting possible. And you could fit in some of those examples into these into this uh, table. So, you know, in some cases we you are underestimating the potential benefit, which is what the risk averse person <coughs> does, or the risk averse person is overestimating the potential harm. They want low probability if there's significant losses. Um, and if it's gains, they want a high probability. Whereas with the other two, uh, they're either underestimating the harm or overestimating the potential benefit. So decision making is very important, especially in risk assessment, or making any decision with regard to cyber security. And so our beliefs, our opinions about things, our perception 
our impressions are all factors that are part of this decision-making process. We can be prejudiced, we can be biased, we can have opinions about things. That doesn't give good risk decision-making. Uh, we can have certain impressions and feelings that we've formed through our experiences all have an impact. So, I think I'm, am I running out of time? So I'm going to jump that slide. I just, so, security is the fear of nothing. So, what is insecurity? Insecurity, or risk to our security, is to implant thoughts in our mind to generate insecure feelings or false sense of security. So, I'm just going to give you three quick examples to end off with. One is critical infrastructure attacks. Decision making in critical infrastructure is very, very important. When there is a major incident happening, say in a city, and it affects many parts of the infrastructure, then uh, certain processes kick in, uh, crisis management, uh, emergency management, the ability to, to select choices under stressful urgency and involving risk-related circumstances is very important. So for those that are involved in dealing with the, the crisis, how they deal with it, their psychology is very important. Of course, there's the after there's the effect on the public, the citizens, society, the traumas, the distress is also important. One of the key things is to reduce uh, the likelihood of bad decision making. And of course, the big question for anybody that's uh, employing people in cyber security to run critical systems and to make security and safety decisions are they psychologically healthy and emotionally sound why would you employ someone that was psychologically imbalanced to deal with security and safety food for thought Online I mean, cyber crime. Again, there are lots of psychological aspects to this. Um, crimes against property, crimes against people. How does what does the criminal thing feel? How do how are they motivate? Well, when psychologists go in, um, whatever forensic psychology means, uh, I know it means various definitions, but if um, psychologists go in, they want to know, they want to look, assess uh, the state of mind of the, of the criminal, um, the likelihood of re-offencing, the causes of offence, and of course the victims of, um, of the crime. And of course whether it's what type of behaviour uh, has led to what type of person has led to that behaviour. Um, so again, all those thoughts I've gone through are all important to look at how we deal with criminals that have been involved in cybercrime. And finally, <coughs> cyber technology. There's nothing we can do about it. We have a changing and advancing technology environment. And some of this technology is disruptive. It disrupts our lives, it disrupts our business, and we just embrace it. Now, some of this technology uh, will change our behavior, the way we do things, the way we play, how we communicate, uh, it could be an improvement to the quality of our life, or it could be 
degrade the quality of life. So, some food for thought. Uh, humans are basically averse to emotional change, where the change is negative. Um, we don't like emotional change. The other thing is we have emotional attachments to things, which is the cause of our disease or our suffering. So, technology can have uh, wide implications on our lives. It can make our lives better, or it can make our lives a disaster. And some of the examples where young people have ended up seeing psychotherapists and psychologists because of using social networking, and they've become depressed or obsessive. So technology, you know, if we use it right, but my fear, my, my point here is that we shouldn't lose track of the social and the psychological aspects of technology because it's, if we ignore them, then disruptive technology is going to make, it's not going to improve the quality of life, it's likely to degrade the quality of life. So those are some of my quick thoughts about this. Um, and... Uh, if you want to get in touch with me about any of these aspects, then I can give you a business card. Um, if you want to know more references, books, papers on this subject, again, I can uh, give you references. So, thank you very much. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, Ryan asked whether there's any sociologists in the room, uh, lawyers somewhere. Um, computer scientists. Do we have any classical students? Studied ancient Greek? No? Okay. I, I apologize to the psychologists. I thought I might have to apologize to people studying classics. Thank you very much. mathematician up in the top floor here of the building. And, uh, and uh, we had a long chat and I, I gave him a quote from uh, a Stoic quote. And the Stoic quote is that everybody in the world is mad. Uh, we're all neurotic, but in different ways, at different levels, minor and major. So we're all on those, we're all categorized that same way. Uh, uh, but now I agree with you to the extent that um, this framing is very important. You can actually move audiences, you can move people by the words we use and the language we use. So, any other questions? Right. Well, what would you say one of the uh, biggest factors is in, uh, in people evaluating risk? Depends what type of risk. I mean, uh, in general. Yes. 
think one of the hardest things to evaluate is the likelihood of the risk. Right. The no, the likelihood. Ah. <laughs> um, uh, there are two subjects. There's mathematical likelihoods and mathematical probability. They are different. We can talk about it later. Um, I think uh, risk is uh, is very very subjective, and our our, our calculations of right, uh, likelihoods are, are not that accurate unless you have a lot of statistical data and historical data about a topic. Reliability figures say on products going down or not. But in general, it's, it's, it's far more, in a, it's far in a,